is it me who has gone through a transformation or has the country and the world around us transformed radically over these last, you know, four or five, six years? And um, it, it's, it's, it's interesting because people will come to me like, God, Tulsi, what, what made you such a conservative or what made you such a this or a that? Uh, how, how did you, and this is one that I often get, is how did you go from, you know, endorsing Bernie Sanders in 2016 to writing a book about everything that's wrong with the Democrat elite today and why you left the Democratic Party? And um, if you just look at, like, the top lines, uh, it doesn't make sense. Um, but when you actually look at, you know, for me, the reason why I've made the decisions that I've made in politics, why I've taken the positions that I've taken, there's a very strong through line there that hasn't changed, that, that, that's rooted in the Constitution, that's rooted in um, doing my best to try to hold our leaders to account for the oath that they took uh, when, when, they, when they entered that political office. Um, you know, for, for I, I was at a, an event with the Lincoln Club of Orange County last night, and this woman came up to me and she said, I just don't get it. I love you. I love everything you stand for. How in the world could you have supported Bernie Sanders? And I told her, I said, there was one reason why I resigned as vice chair of the DNC to endorse Bernie Sanders was because I knew then and know now that Hillary Clinton as president commander in chief would be the most dangerous thing mm. for our country and for our troops and for the cause of our ability to live in a peaceful, prosperous society. And so that was the way for me. Bernie Sanders has long been largely non-interventionist and um, it was an opportunity for me to be able to uh, expose Hillary Clinton for who she is and the threat that she would pose to our country's ability to live in a secure, free world or secure, free country. And, uh, and, and if you remember, that was at a time when she was running for president and everyone on uh, TV and the talking heads, not just her cronies in the Democratic Party, but you turn on TV and people are like, it is indisputable that Hillary Clinton is the most qualified person ever to run for president in our nation's history. And even then, I, you know, I'm a Democrat in Congress. I'm vice chair of the DNC. I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> in the entire history of our nation, she's the most qualified one? <laughs> and, then, and then they never backed it up. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a statement that was thrown out there and widely just accepted on its face by, by the Washington establishment. And because it was accepted on its face without any evidence or, uh, you know, here's why we believe this to be true, uh, no one would challenge it because you don't you don't want to in Washington you don't want to be the one person standing out and being like uh, y'all are wrong <laughs> <laughs> like where's your proof uh, to support this pretty pretty powerful statement in the history of the United States and obviously it would point to all of her fancy titles but but the reason why I made that decision to to um, you know endorse Bernie Sanders over Hillary Clinton and take advantage of that platform was because I talked about her record that proved my conclusion, which was how dangerous it would be as an American for me, as a soldier, as a veteran, for us as the American people to allow her to be in this position. And so you look at, you know, for me, you look at that decision there and you look at where we stand today. I'll, I'll fast forward to 2020, mm -hmm. where my going on the presidential debate stage in that Democratic primary and simply saying, I love my country was a controversial statement to make. Like, that's a radical right-wing conservative thing. Why are you doing that? And, and if you remember back then, there was actual news stories about like, oh, look at Trump. He has like 20 American flags on his stage. What's wrong with him? And, you know, the Democrats had two. You know, it's just like, it's, it's such a bizarre world to live in. And it's only gotten worse. Here we are in 2024. It's only gotten worse now where, um, you know, saluting the flag. Um, the, the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, what's his name, Butker? Uh, the, the speech that he just gave at, at, oh, yeah, at Catholic yeah, yeah. University yeah. Yeah. Uh, recently. Like his, his expression of his Catholic faith, speaking at a Catholic University's graduation <laughs> ceremony, led to this huge uproar and uh, people trying to cancel him. And then you look at... Um, Who's the other guy? The, the, the guy who took a st I can't remember his name right now, but who kneeled. Uh, uh, who Ka star Kaepernick. Kaepernick. Yep, yep. Kaepernick. 
and um, it, it's mm-hmm. just it's it's just a you know obviously in how he was celebrated by mm-hmm. the Democrat elite and look at his bravery and look at his courage, and this this kind of leads to the point where when we live in a country and and why I left the Democratic Party we live in a country where. Um, having an American flag displayed at your home is seen as a, a conservative action or right-wing Republican action. That saying you love your country, that celebrating and 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 saluting when when the Star Spangled Banner is played, uh, standing up for free speech, whether you like the speech or not, all of these things are considered very you know MAGA or Trumpian in this in this environment that we are in. And and then those who are are standing against that, uh, the the Democrat elite are are claiming to defend free speech and save democracy, while their actions prove that they are doing the exact opposite of that. So yes, the the country, the Democrat Party leadership, has radically radically changed. Uh, certainly from the Democratic Party I joined over twenty years ago. But even over these last several years, the brazen abuse of power and their, um, you know, when I, when I look at my years in Congress and look at the, the Democrats in Congress today, it's, a, it's shocking to me how longtime leaders who were unafraid to step outside the party line, even while I was there, it's now total compliance, total conformity. If you dare to stand against your president, Joe Biden, then uh, then you will face the kinds of consequences that I faced when I stood up against Barack Obama as as a as a Democrat in Congress. And, and that's just what makes me sad is that how many people are elected into these positions of great power and leadership and public service are more concerned about what the party bosses think of them and will do to them than they are concerned about the American people. Are they complying just because that's how they get money and that's how they get reelected and that's how they keep themselves in power? Is that the for reason some for of compli- them, For some for of them, it, it's that is certainly a part of it, um, especially people who have you know tough districts that are you know that they got to spend a lot of money to try to win and they're hard fought districts. Um, there's a few of them here in California like that. And the party has, um, both political parties, quite frankly, have an inordinate amount of power and leverage because of their money, where you can only, if you want to give money to a candidate or, or a member of Congress, the, the max, I think, this year is $3,300. But you can write a million-dollar check mm-hmm. to a political party, and that is then used as leverage on the House floor when you've got somebody saying, like, yeah, I'm not going to I'm not gonna go along on this one. I'm going to vote my conscience or vote my district. That's where those threats come into play. It's like, hey, we know you got a tough fight ahead of you. We had $10 million set aside for your race. If you don't do what we want you to do, then bye. Mm-hmm. But I think for, for uh, again, when I'm thinking of a lot of uh, my former colleagues, many have served there for 10 years, 20 years, who've been there for, for a long time, who aren't at risk of losing in their in their um, elections. It they are conforming because of fear. Um, you know, their their friends and their peers, their their colleagues, they are concerned about being kicked out of the club. Do you see the same type and, of- Sorry, the, the last piece of that, and this, this just came up the other day, the last piece of that is like, okay, so for those even who've been entrenched in Washington for a very long time, um, the threat that is often used is, if you um, if you don't side with us on this, if you go against Joe Biden, if you say nope, I disagree with President Biden on this issue, then uh, you will be helping get Donald Trump elected, and that's like the ultimate. It doesn't even matter the substance of what it is or how much it might make sense or how insane the policy they're opposing might be. That is the threat that's used. Do you want to be responsible for getting Donald Trump? elected and that's where we've seen over these last years and especially as we head into this election um that threat is working for too many for for all all of them Mm -hmm. do you see the same level of uh, flexing of power on the republican side and the same level of compliance no um the the flexing and the threats there that's definitely that's there that's certainly there um but it's interesting that the Republican Party has become what the Democratic Party used to be. There's been like this flip-flop mm-hmm. in in roles where 
you know, it's it's become quite lively, mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of different personalities and a lot of people exerting their their position. And and uh, I I get asked sometimes from Republican operatives like, tell us the secret of how the Democrats like. What what's their tactic that makes it so everybody just falls in line? Mm-hmm. Like they're asking me because they want to try to use it on their side. <laughs> but it's uh, to me, it's it's a de- democracy is supposed to be messy and mm-hmm. lively and robust with debate and disagreement, and not just and especially not just in a partisan sense. And that's what our founders warned against that 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 hyper partisanship would be. The, the demise and destruction of a true representative democracy, which which we've seen a lot of. But I think it's encouraging to see that the Republican Party, uh, especially as, as we see in Congress, is um, it, it is becoming more and more of that big open tent party that, that you have people who have very strong disagreements on issues of great importance and actively have those debates both in their in their um, Republican conference meetings behind closed doors, but the, they get carried out in public as well. And I think it's representative of more representative of the country, and how people have different ideas and different views on things. And taking that Washington establishment position, um, and and that it's really kind of pitted against the populist position in many cases, or the views of the people. Yeah, it's interesting. As I was reading your book, one of the people that you quote more than. I think it might be the most quoted person is is John F. Kennedy. Yes. Which, again, to me, here you are saying like, hey, here's a great speech from this person who had the ideals that I think are good for America, and it's a Democrat. It's just a Democrat from whatever, 60-something years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and I, I, you know, I, these, I brought him up and, and quoted him and quoted Reverend Martin Luther King during those 2020 presidential debates. And... Uh, the party bosses and kind of that inner core of, of the Democratic Party base, they, they wouldn't have it. They wouldn't have it. And these are two of the most celebrated Democrat icons uh, in, in history. But when you actually say, okay, let's, let's listen to what they were saying mm-hmm. and understand how their words very, very much apply to the challenges we face as a country today. And we would all, as Americans, be better off taking heed to uh, their calls to action, not interested, not just, interested. Just shut down? A wholesale rejection. It's, it's even worse than just not paying attention. It's a wholesale rejection. And yes, shut down. In, in, one, um, in one of the debates, I think it may have been the last debate that I participated in, uh, Kamala Harris's, you know, my, it was me at the podium making a pitch to, to, to really change the Democratic Party and bring it back to being the party that fought for the little guy, the party that celebrated free speech. And the comeback that Kamala Harris came with was, don't listen to her. She goes on Fox News. <laughs> and the whole crowd like started clapping. And then uh, and she's like, don't listen to her. She criticized Barack Obama. And of course, like, there's no, oh, wh- why did she criticize his position? Oh, really? It was because he wanted to go start another stupid counterproductive war in the Middle East that I thought would be a really bad idea. None of that. Mm-hmm. It's She's not a member of the team. She's not a blind follower. She had the audacity to, to, to challenge the president and the head of our own party, my former party. And uh, she wants the party to go and actually represent the people. And and that that was it, it was such an eye opening experience on so many levels, but it was it was very revealing about their mindset, their priorities, and the there I'm talking about is is the Democrat elite, which is distinct and different from Democrats who I hear from all the time across the country, people who still call themselves Democrats, but who hate what the party, uh, the National Party, uh, is doing. 